get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, and many more, how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, I'm excited. We have Ronald Pruitt. He's founder of For a Good Cause. His e-commerce fundraising software programs have helped nonprofits and resulted in millions of dollars raised in online donations across the U.S. and Canada for the past 17 plus years. So we will talk about the early days of the internet. Last year alone, they had $11.6 million raised online by four good cause nonprofits. They've created e-commerce solutions for the Girl Scouts, Alzheimer's Foundation of America, Big Brothers Big Sisters, Ronald McDonald House Charities of Baltimore, and many, many more. They help nonprofits get paid, and that's the bottom line. Ronald, thanks for joining me. I uh, appreciate you uh, having me on. I'm excited I'm, to chat. I'm and very I always, excited. Yeah, I always like to include a fun fact, and a really cool fun fact about you is, I mean, you can read it on about page, obviously, like the Atlanta Hawks and, and a bunch of other things, but you have 10,000 comic books, and you've been collecting comic books for how long? Probably since I was eight years old. Wow. It's just something I fell in love with. I, you know, I, I think when I was young, I wasn't. Uh, I don't know that I was a great reader. I didn't have things that I really fell in love with. Anything that really inspired me. Yeah. And uh, we took a little trip to the local stop and shop back in the days when comic books were sold at yeah. the local Seven Eleven. And I picked up. Uh, I think I picked up an Incredible Hulk and something else, and just came home and just fell in love with it. And then. I begged my parents to get me a monthly subscription so that the books would start coming to the house. And uh, yeah, now I'm up to 10,000 books. Wow. It's just something that uh, it's just inspired me, I think. Yeah. Uh, one of the things, you know, Spider Man's always been my favorite. Mm. Uh, he and, and Daredevil. And Spider Man is the great quote you know, with great power comes great responsibility. Right. Uh, you've probably seen that in the movies. Yes. Uh, that's something that. I think it's inspired me, you know, that when you're when you're out there doing stuff, you need to make sure that you're doing doing not just well for yourself, but well for the community as well. It's something that shaped me. It's an entertaining thing. Mm-hmm. Um, in my office, I have. Uh, Do you have any of, around you now that you? Uh, uh, well, I have uh, some. I have a lot of comic book poster art. Um, I don't know if you can see there. Vampire so, Strikes I, Back. Yeah, we've got uh, our giant Spider-Man. I've got the original poster uh, from the first Spider-Man movie. I've got the wow. Twin Towers uh, poster. Um, What's your most prized comic books? Ooh, um, I, I well, I do have a 1934 Bugs Bunny one. Like which uh, one would you not part with if someone oh. offered you a lot of money? <laughs> <laughs> Probably some of the early Spider-Man ones that I have. Yeah. Uh, I have some in the, um, you know, under issue 50. Uh, I have an early Daredevil one, number four, I believe. Mm. Uh, just some ones that I, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't part with them. Right. I don't, I don't know that I would be ready to part with most any of them just yet. <laughs> the, the, my wife is ready for me to yeah. part with a few. They're starting to overrun the house. She's singing so. a different tune. Yeah, she's like, sell all of them, get rid of them. Right. Um, you know, what's interesting, I want to get into the early days, um, even growing up, you know, because you've been in the inception of the internet and you've, you know, kind of been in the industry for, you know, since the beginning, essentially. But um, going back, um, where'd you grow up and what was, what were some of the big influences for you? I'm originally from Spartanburg, South Carolina, mm. which if anyone's ever driven up I-85, um, if you ever see the big peach there in Gaffney, South Carolina, uh, if you've seen uh, House of Cards, sure. uh, the main character is, is from Gaffney, South Carolina. That's uh, where You kind of remind me of Kevin Spacey a little bit, <laughs> oh, actually. <yeah. laughs> well, my wife did tell me to throw on a little accent uh, <laughs> while I was doing this, so... 
Um, if you've ever seen the Big Peach, that's where we're from yeah. there. Um, you know, it, it's a small town. Uh, I think, you know, my early influences were probably family, family mm-hmm. and friends. Um, my grandfather on my father's side um, was just the kindest man that I that I think I've ever known. Mm. Uh, and just learned a lot from him as far as uh, being kind to others, following your passion. He, he owned a farm. So, uh, what kind of farm? Well, it was mostly animals. You know, he would have a passion. His passion would change every couple of years. You mm-hmm. know, it would be rabbits, then it would be horses, then it would be cows, then it was dogs. But he just loved life. And yeah. I remember going over there, and at one point he had finches. And you could just go into the into the finch house, and it was just amazing. He would just sit with the birds all day. Hmm. He just had a passion. He wasn't really looking to make money. He was looking to um, just follow what he enjoyed doing every day. Right. Um, my father uh, taught me to be constant. I don't remember him ever uh, sick. He worked at the textile uh, manufacturing. Uh, never called in sick, always was there, worked whatever shift that they needed him to do, whatever job that they needed him to do. He's, he was there for 30 years. Mm. And you know, that was an influence just to work hard every day. Mm-hmm. Whatever you need to do to get things done, that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to be forthright and mm-hmm. and go to work every day. So, What was an act uh, of kindness you saw from your grandfather that you still think back on? Well, he used to... Um, he had dealings with other people when he would buy uh animals he um, you know he would he wasn't a great businessman but he would he would take an animal maybe that he shouldn't that the other person needed to get rid of mm-hmm. uh, and bring it onto his farm um, probably pay too much for it mm-hmm. uh, and then sometime later a couple of years later he would sell it back to them for less than what he paid Mm -hmm. um and just kind to to his kids and could tell a story Mm -hmm. loved to tell a story Mm -hmm. loved to tell a joke um could sit down and just talk you have a favorite grandfather story that he told (laughs) oh um that you probably heard 10 times before (laughs) well he used to uh he used to always kid the children especially my uh, uh my family we weren't the best eaters so he loved to tell the story of how, oh, anytime the grandchildren come over, I don't have to cook for them. All I have to do is run a hot dog under some warm water, <laughs> throw it on a plate. So he would always be joking, you know, joking with you, not really at your expense, but uh, he made his bring, point. Yeah. Right, right. Bringing the family together. So, Did you do anything entrepreneurial from a young age? Not entrepreneurial, but I've had a job and been working since I was 16. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I certainly didn't come from a wealthy family. If you wanted money, if you wanted you your own it. car, you, yeah. if you wanted to pay for the insurance on your car, you had to go out and work for it. Mm-hmm. So um, from age 16 all the way through till I graduated college, I was, um, I, had a, I was working retail. Mm-hmm. What was your uh, worst job that you had? The worst job was the very first job I ever had. It was uh, uh, telesales. Oh, cold so calls. I was, cold calls. I was hawking little coupon books, and I just felt horrible doing it. I you were call. the early Groupon. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> we would call folks, and it would typically be the elderly, and you felt like you were just scamming them. I, just, really? I, only, la- I only lasted a week. It was just not for me i just i you know when you don't believe in the product yeah that you're selling, exactly because you i could see it. if it benefiting people you know if, if it's, they're good coupons i don't know they weren't what'd you <laughs> le- what'd you learn from cold calling from that week you know i think just love what you do if you don't then you are going to have the most miserable time you mm-hmm. can ever imagine mm-hmm. and i did i did um, and then, but then after that, I went. I went to the mall and I found a department store and talked to some people and knew some people that worked there. And I ended up working on the dock. 
Hmm. And I, it, would, it was my job to stock the shelves, to bring out the merchandise, to do all the little things to keep the store running. I did that for two years. And then when I went to college, I looked for a similar job that I could have while in college. And mm-hmm. I worked almost full time doing that at another department store in the mall. Uh, it just taught me a lot about uh, just hard work, coming to work every day. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, it was a great experience. Ronald, when did you discover computers? Late. Uh, you know, when I was, I went to Auburn and I had plans to be an engineer. Yeah, I saw that you studied materials engineering. Yeah. Materials engineering, yes, which is all about, um, you know, if you're going to build a building, you got to know what type of steel mm. that you're going to make it out of. Or if you're going to make something out of plastics, you have to know, you know, how to. Uh, build that plastic material yeah. and um, I I got to the end of that degree I was in my last semester I had just found that I passed my last course and I s- came back to my apartment and I sat down and I realized that I just hated it I realized mm. that it just had no interest for me I think I had been stubborn and once you're in it you know I felt like that I had to finish that right. degree and I remember uh, there was a day I was I was screaming at the walls. I was so I was just angry at myself. I was angry that I kind of wasted all this time. Mm-hmm. And luckily enough, my best friend he knocked on my door just at that moment. And he came in, and I started. We started talking about you know what I was feeling, what I was going through. And he just said, "Have you thought about the MBA program?" Because he was just finishing up the MBA program. Mm. And I said, no, I hadn't thought about that. Um, he said, you know, you can come into it from any degree. And he said, you know, I think maybe looking to do something for yourself. I, maybe business is, is where you should be. And I, it was a revelation. I said, let me try it. Um, I applied. I had to take some additional business classes before I could get into the MBA. Mm-hmm. Um, and I started taking accounting and finance and, and all this stuff, and I loved it. I absolutely loved it. I had found a passion there. My grades certainly improved. I went from C plus to A plus mm. because I was studying something that I really cared about. Mm-hmm. And during the MBA program is really when the internet was really coming into play. You were talking the days of AOL, CompuServe was still a viable company. I, I had a CS.com account. <laughs> yeah. There you go. There you go. And I just made a decision that since it was new, that's what I was going to go into. Mm. I didn't have a lot of background in it, um, really zero. And I don't think they really emphasized it a great deal in the MBA program. But as I started to interview um, coming out of Auburn, I remember that I was interviewing for a lot of business type positions. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, I kept asking them, well, tell me about your website. And, and I ended up not not getting a lot of those jobs because I was so focused on that I wanted to do something in the internet space. Right, right. And I ended up, um, I created my own HTML resume. So I built myself a little mini website as a and way. And that's to, huge back in, back in that day. Yeah, that was 1996. Mm-hmm. So I taught myself HTML. I put myself a little... HTML resume out there, just to show that I knew what the internet was, that I could talk the talk. Mm-hmm. And a small company in Atlanta uh, called me up and said, "We want you to come up for an interview. Mm-hmm. We have kind of an operations management type position, and they did a lot of web design work." This was Cybernet Solutions. C- Cybernet Solutions, yes. They were an offshoot of a magazine. They did a lot of publishing, and then so they created a little web design arm so they could do basically web publishing for companies. Mm-hmm. And I came up and I interviewed. They loved the fact that I they knew about the web and uh, how I really got into development and computers was I walked in the first day on that job, and they said, well, you were going to be the operations manager, but our programmer quit. Good luck. Uh, yesterday. <laughs> Now that you are here, and since you've shown that you know how to program, you're now going to be the operations person and the programmer. Wow! So then I a lot had of responsibility. To, 
yeah, I had to teach myself right then and there. And luckily there was another programmer on staff and I just followed his lead and and taught myself everything I could about computers. Yeah. So, you must have been doing some, you know, for that time, cutting edge stuff. What were some of the things when you look back on that was cutting edge that you do you laugh at now? Well, one thing that's always funny, you look back on those days and you think, gosh, if we'd only knew what we were working on then, right. we could be we could be billionaires now because right. we actually built a little program that allowed you to check your email on the web. Mm. And we built it for a little company that that just wanted to have access to that and then, you know, I was still at Cybernet maybe a year and a half later, and we read, you know, how Hotmail was sold for $400 million. Right. Yeah, you so know, to give people the landscape, what, when you built that small program so people check email, what else was on the web at that time? Not much. Uh, you're talking about the earliest days of, you know, Microsoft.com. Uh, this was uh, the browsers that were used at the time were uh, Netscape. Mm-hmm. Uh, precursor to Firefox, mm -hmm. uh, Internet Explorer 1.0 mm -hmm. was there. Uh, so there really wasn't much. It was mostly big companies. Um, really, the blog phenomenon had not started yet. Mm -hmm. That came later. That was you know more around uh, 2000, a little bit after when blogs started. So it was really just larger companies. And I felt like they had to have some type of web presence. AOL was still really the main way that people were accessing the internet. Mm -hmm. So, you know, companies were uh, still had a, a regular website and an AOL website. Uh, it really was the early days. We had makeshift um, computer web servers that were in the office that were hooked up to a T1 line. I I remember having to. I got calls at in midnight we need you to go into the office and reboot the server wow so it really was you were flying by the seat of our pants so when did you see that explosion you said hotmail sold for 400 million when was that when did you see that or or realize that you missed that opportunity for the for the email oh well, that was late 90s okay. um and then but of course then we had the dot com bust right that came right after that mm -hmm. so I think I've been doing this so long. I've seen quite a few of the mm -hmm. the booms and the busts of the internet. Yeah. So what was it like? What was the main learning you think you got from Cybernet Solutions? How to program, like kind of understanding the logic of mm -hmm. kind of how the web works. We not I don't not only learned programming, but I also learned um, I also learned networking firewalls, security, mm -hmm. we were kind of a jack of all trades there. Uh, I think the other thing that I learned is just you know, being in an office, interacting with people. I learned a lot about what not to do. Mm -hmm. Like what? Uh, like don't berate your employees. Don't. Uh, <laughs> you don't seem like someone who would berate employees. Though. No, no, I would never. I would never. I don't believe in that. You just saw that happening. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you work... Uh, you work since you're 16, you're going to have a lot of bad bosses. Right, and, right. And I had a few. Um, you learn how a company dissolves itself. Cybernet basically went away. Hmm. Um, it got bought out, you know, and then basically just faded away. Uh, you know, you see things that don't quite work. You know, a company, we never really had a niche. Uh, that certainly influenced me later. Mm -hmm. um, we would build websites for anyone. We mm -hmm. would try to take all comers. We yeah. tried to take on projects that we couldn't f really fulfill. Mm -hmm. We would take these big security projects from you know big corporations and walk in, and we really didn't have the expertise to do it, but we were desperate for clients. Mm -hmm. And that's, n that's never going to be a way that you're going to have success. So it was really just one of those small companies, one of those little internet companies that probably was never going to make it, but you learn a lot while you're there. Mm -hmm. So what made you start for a good cause? Well, after Cybernet, I took a consulting or kind of a contract job at MCI WorldCom. Mm -hmm. And I was doing projects for them mostly for their intranet. So I was managing, I would be managing 
a web developer that would be building a website for internal consumption, mostly for sales and marketing. So we would be building websites that the sales team would look at to know how much all their products cost, what the current promotions are. Uh, kind of like a and, dashboard system. Right, right, things like that. So, And I was there for six months, and, you know, I, I started talking to the wife, you know, talking to, you know, the developers that we were working with, and I was enjoying kind of the contract aspect of it. Mm-hmm. And really decided that I wanted to go out and build something on my own. Mm -hmm. That I didn't want to be locked into a company. And I I don't think that culture-wise I really fit in at MCI. Um, I certainly didn't. I wasn't a suit and tie person. I wasn't. I didn't see myself. I couldn't envision myself being that big corporate type person. I I, I think I had some sort of entrepreneurial fire in me, I wanted to go out and create something uh, on my own. Mm-hmm. So, luckily enough, uh, near the end of the contract with MCI, I got a another kind of contract with um, the local health system here in Atlanta. Mm-hmm. And I did some on-site work for them, and then some off-site work for them. Basically, building websites, advising them on on how to build both external websites and uh, you know, intranet, internal websites. And I just enjoyed it. It kind of took off from there. I mm-hmm. borrowed $5,000 from my father to just tide me over until I could, you know, start making a regular income. Uh, luckily, you know, things started working out. I started getting more contracts. Uh, I paid him back within a year. I was mm-hmm. so happy. That was a huge, you know. Yeah, milestone. you don't want to owe your family money. No, you, you know. never do. You never do. Um, when I started out, we weren't even called for a good calls. It was the the company name was Open Consult okay. Incorporated. Um, I kind of got the name from kind of the open standards of the internet combined with consulting. It probably wasn't a great name, and uh, but I think there there was a just a desire to build something on my own, go out and make a difference on my own, just to kind of see what I could do. I don't really didn't have a lot of direction yeah and that certainly hurt me early on because i think when i got started didn't have a niche um i think just like cybernet i was i would build a website or work for any type of company that i could Mm -hmm. um i started doing advertising you know in the local trade magazines and you know newspapers Mm -hmm. um but without really a story to tell it really hurt me early on i i didn't have a story that said open consult is this company right. and this right. is why we're different um so i mean that built up you know debt it was it was it was tough starting uh it really everything changed for me and how for good cause came about mm-hmm. is i got a contract with the boys and girls clubs of america mm-hmm. which they're headquartered here in atlanta mm. And I was, it was both on-site work and off-site work, and I was going down there and really advising them. How on, did you get them in the first place? I think a referral mm-hmm. um, from uh, the health system that I was working for. Mm-hmm. Uh, they knew someone down there, and um, I got in touch with that person, and uh, they said, you know, we're we're looking for somebody who's worked on intranets and understands kind of the inner workings of it they were trying to find a way that they could work with all their all their local clubs all across the united states to get mm-hmm. information to them and so i came in and, and advised them and helped them build their first um intranet and mm-hmm. one of the one of the projects that we did was a website called career quest and what it was it was basically a website for the teens that they were working with that advised them on on various careers. It was kind of an interactive website so that you could look up whether you wanted to be a policeman or you wanted to be a lawyer, what type of and what type of education that you needed mm-hmm. um, and that. And you know, we had a really cool design for it. I had a really good design partner um, uh, that I worked with for many, many years. And we built something really, really cool and I just fell in love with that project. Mm. 
And I remember coming home and telling my wife that, you know, we've just built a website that's going to do good out in the community. It's, it's going to be more than just pushing some corporate product. Mm-hmm. This is something that's going to make a difference. You saw like a, a huge impact. Right, a huge impact. And it really st- it got me focused on, well, maybe our niche could be focusing just on nonprofits. Hmm. Let's just build websites for nonprofits, yeah. and um, we did that. You know, I, I did another edition of the Open Consult website where that was the focus. I got connected with the North Carolina Center for Nonprofits. It was really one of our first nonprofit clients, mm-hmm. and they needed a way for people to pay them to come to their conference. They have a big conference every year. They really didn't have a way mm. on their website that people could come, yeah. fill in their information, put in their credit card, get paid, you know, for them to get paid for that conference registration fee. So that was the first time we really built a for good cause product. Right. It's helping them um, get paid for those registrations. And mm-hmm. it was really just a simple little form yeah, we put their logo on it. It was a simple form. Uh, we gave them a little database where they could get reports on their registrations. Um, so know, even got- from that time, you saw the biggest need was they didn't have a way to get get paid online for for whether it was an event or some other service that they're providing. Right. There was there really wasn't a lot of options for them. There were a few kind of shopping cart providers, but there was nothing that there was not a lot out there that was nonprofit specific. There wasn't a lot out there that for companies like ours that would customize something for the nonprofit. So mm-hmm. you couldn't you certainly couldn't do something specific to a conference registration mm-hmm. uh, where you're you're trying to take really customized information that they're going to bring you know, these three people they need a vegetarian meal on Saturday for the you know for the for the breakfast or whatever that they're having there at the conference there really wasn't a lot of options there yeah. and so at that point we decided let's let's make this a product let's mm-hmm. uh, and we we dubbed the product the product name was forgoodcause.com mm-hmm. and I created a separate site that where we would host all of the e-commerce pages that we were building for people mm-hmm. Which you creating? I created a niche there, which yeah. was great, and that's what we've done now for so many years. This was in. What uh, made you decide to? Pro- so you productized it, so you made it yeah. so it's a platform instead of building like almost custom sites every time. What made you decide to shift? Because I still feel like today, a lot of you know web developers they'll just do customized sites. And I wonder what shifted you to actually create one main platform. As I knew, I would there would never be enough time in the day mm-hmm. for me uh, or anybody that was helping me to mm-hmm. build um, custom sites every single time. Mm-hmm. I, you know, we at least I at least needed to start with a template, and that's what we did. We essentially, in a sense, really did build custom sites for each of the clients, but mm-hmm. we started with templates and modules that we had because we wanted to save us time yeah. we wanted to save them time mm-hmm. and also I, at that point I was really switching my business model I was really moving to a recurring revenue model mm-hmm. which at first was really really hard because what was hard about it wow we, you're, you're coming from getting paid by the project um, or getting paid by the hour to moving to we're gonna we're gonna charge you a setup fee we're going to charge you a small hosting fee Mm -hmm. we're going to charge you a small transaction fee so we're tying ourselves to their success Um, but I knew that that was going to be a long haul that it was going to be to build uh, up that that membership that's right you're going to you're going to need a lot of nonprofit clients paying you that monthly fee before that really kicks in and you become as profitable uh, as you want it to, and I think we had some hiccups early on. Certainly, you know the fact that I productized it, so it was confusing, and I I probably was stubborn like this. I think I was maybe I was investing in the niche, but I don't know that I was 
um, fully investing, mm -hmm. like really going wholeheartedly, and that we were going to be the e-commerce company because we were still doing a few websites, mm -hmm. you know, custom websites for folks. And so, Open Consult was the company name for GoodCause.com was the product. Mm -hmm. It took me a lot of years to realize that that was confusing people. Mm -hmm. It took me a while to realize that the nonprofits that we worked with wanted us to focus on the e-commerce part. They wanted to to call us for a good cause. That's yeah. what they saw us as. Right. So eventually I went down to the local county and said, we're changing our name. And from from that point on, we were for a good cause. And, mm -hmm. and e-commerce e commerce was the focus. Um, we still do custom you know websites from time to time, but e-commerce mm -hmm. is is what we focus on. It's what we're great at. Um, you know, so many years of experience, we know what works there. Yeah. What was one of those conversations you had with one of the nonprofits that you knew we didn't need to do e-commerce? Because I could see early on, like, oh, maybe we'll just do events for nonprofit. And, you know, so what made you, what was one of those conversations that you thought they really want this e-commerce component? Well, you know, I think, um, we had a lot of conversations with nonprofits that they were struggling with taking donations online. Hmm. It wasn't, you know, there were a few services out there, um, but again, they weren't, they didn't have the ability to customize for people and, and give them those little custom tweaks that, that their donors wanted, you know, the ability to, to give an honor or memory of someone, mm -hmm. the ability to, to choose any program that they wanted to give to, really to make that process simple mm -hmm. and easy. And I think what, what made the marketplace viable uh, really was, uh, I look back to 9-11 uh, because, you know, I tell a story after 9-11, uh, President Bush came out into the Rose Garden and he wanted the American people to raise money for all these New York charities, the Red Cross, um, you know, different fireman funds and, mm -hmm. and things like that. Well, he didn't tell them to put your pennies in a jar and we'll come by and pick them up. He didn't <laughs> say call. He, did, he, said, he didn't say call this 1-800 number. He didn't say put a check in the mail. He said, we've created this website, and we want you to go here, and we want you to give mm -hmm. online. And I think that right there just taught the American public that that you can give online. You can go mm -hmm. onto a website, you can open, put your credit card in, and you can make a donation. That plus, at that time, Amazon was really booming, you know, starting its boom. You know, really people teaching are used people, to paying online. Right. Teaching people that e commerce was the right thing. And we saw it as a as a great niche um to you know, this is what nonprofits need. Nonprofits are in the business of fundraising. Mm -hmm. And we can be in the business of providing an easy way to make that happen. Mm -hmm. So uh, payment pages, hosting those for them, allowing them not to have to handle all the security of it mm -hmm. the programming we can just bring all that for them all they had to do is just set up a link on their website and we would yeah. take care of everything yeah so ronald what did you see happen in your business after 9 11 well it was a dual thing on the one hand they were teaching nonprofits that this could be a real viable option for mm -hmm. them uh, so we were able to use that as a story in the sales. We were able to explain to people that this is something that you needed to be doing. The big charities are doing it. The nationwide charities, the local charities needed to be doing it as well. You need to be competitive. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, we were able to use that. On the other hand, the economy fell out from under everyone. Right. And the donors that were going online to give, they were giving to the Red Cross. They were giving to all these big charities the big ones. They, they were raising millions of dollars for the 9-11 recovery efforts and for these families local charities who who were in the game were that were raising trying to raise money online were hurt by that so there were a couple of years there where you know local charities you know your local girl scouts your local big brothers big sisters organization those were hurt by mm -hmm. that um so after 9-11, certainly things, um, you know, because of the economy, they were leaner than certainly um, 
we wanted them to be. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when I, we were talking early, um, the site looks beautiful. You have a really clear statement. Like it's interesting to hear the progression because you went from open consult to now for good cause. It's very clear message. Your message on the site is very clear. Raise more, keep more. Mm -hmm. Um, and I know you said like, this is like the seventh version or something like that. Yeah. Tell me about some of the different key things that you changed in the different versions when you saw we don't need this at all or wow, this is essential. We need to keep this and, and make it even more prominent. Right. Well, yeah, like you say, it's a seventh or eighth edition. We, mm -hmm. I think we've built a new website for ourselves every couple of years. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we've had successes with it and mistakes along the way. I think the latest edition, what we kind of migrated back to uh, really focusing on what we're best at. So what we wanted to do is highlight really three areas. And I think anytime a company is going to build a website or a nonprofit is going mm -hmm. to build a website, they've got to take themselves through a progression. And the first thing is, why are we building this? Mm -hmm. And for us, I think we wanted to kind of double down on the message that on really three pillars. One is that the pages are extremely user-friendly, so you raise more money. Mm -hmm. The second pillar is that compared to our competitors, our costs are are better. Mm -hmm. And the third is that you know the customer service that you get with us is more is better mm -hmm. than than our competitors. Mm -hmm. So we went through a process of looking at our goals, why we are building this site. Then you're going to look at the user scenarios that you want on the site. Okay, who are we trying to attract on the site? Yeah. And then how are we going to give them as many clicks into where we want to take them. So for us, it's about, like you say, when you hit the homepage, you're going to get that value statement. Mm -hmm. And every company should have in a sentence or you know a couple sentences yeah, right there words. on the homepage. Yeah, yeah, simple. What are you about? What value are you, going to, are you going to give to the customer? And then we link them right into the form to request a demonstration from us mm -hmm. of the software. Yeah. And... We want there are certain things you tested there that you find didn't work. Like right now, you've requested demo. Did you have get a free trial, or were there any things that you tested there that, like, yeah, this isn't working. We have to change it. We've done a lot of things in the past. There's so many different editions of the site. Yeah, mm -hmm. we've had just your basic uh, get in touch. You know, we've had mm -hmm. contact. We've used so many different terminology. Mm -hmm. uh, the ones. The terminology that we have now is really you know, based on best. yeah, it's, and it's based on that sixteen years, sixteen seventeen years right. of doing this. Um, we've had times in our in our past where we've had website additions that maybe we were looking to get more bigger, you know, website projects. We have maybe kind of moved away from the e-commerce a little bit because mm -hmm. we're trying to get other types of projects, and it just hasn't worked because mm. we we walked away from. The what core, really great at, right? And then, and then we would lose, we would confuse the client a little bit. We really, I think, one of the main things I've learned is, is focus on what you're great at. Mm -hmm. The client's going to love you for it. Um, and um, what was the messaging let, on let the that website page? Show that, so. Yeah, what was the messaging on the site when you started to get away from maybe we're trying to get bigger projects or different projects? What was it like then? Uh, it was a lot of back, it was a lot of background on our experience. Mm. Uh, we had a lot about showing a lot of our custom design work. Um, you know, when when in reality, we got we get most of that work from the clients that trust us to do their e-commerce. I see. And we see they see that oh, these guys have built this incredibly user friendly, easy system, and they have so much experience. Mm. Well hey, maybe they will also help us with building right. a little website for their event or mm -hmm. building their entire website. So This builds a lot of trust because right. they come in with, that's what they want and they know you for that and then other stuff just comes. Exactly. Exactly, okay. yes. So what else from the site did you subtract that you got rid of because this is not working or that you added because you were hearing it over and over from customers? Well, testimonials, I, you know, we had, 
the way that we had always done testimonials on the side is they were kind of hidden uh, in a sidebar, or mm-hmm. we would have a single page dedicated to testimonials mm-hmm. where you had to drill into maybe a client list. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you would drill into what these particular clients are saying about us. Mm-hmm. Uh, we really did a lot of research in terms of what um, customers... Converting. Yeah. yeah, converting what customers want to see. And they want to see it big, and they want to see human faces. Yeah. That's something that we had never done before. Yeah. We'd never provide a human face with a testimonial. And all the research is really positive on that. They want to see right. that. Okay, here's a the real individual, person, individual, yeah, individual that endorses it. Another thing that I added that I had never done before um, is added my own photo there. Mm-hmm. I had always had on the little, about page. You mean? Yes. Or, yeah, I'd, yeah. I'd never had a. I'd always had a little mini bio about myself, but I'd mm. never put up a photo of myself. Yeah. Um, you have a friendly face, so it's. Okay, I, you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I've ever tried to make this business about me, though. Um, yeah. It's always been. I've always just tried to let the work stand for itself. But I think you know we looked at it, and you know it's time for. I've been doing this a long time. It's time for me to be more open. They want to see who's I, behind it. That's right, and I appreciate you having me on. I think it's a good positive step for me just to be more out there. Yeah. And uh, so that's something that's something brand new. I mean, I think I like your mindset of you. Know, obviously, you're highlighting the customer, and it's all about the customer. But there is that sense of it's not like you're putting fate, your face like front and center on the homepage, and you don't have like a big ego. At least it seems that way. So, you know, they do want to see that, and I do. You do get that personal feel when you see someone's face. Um, right. And from the homepage, too, what other things did you discover with conversion? Because obviously, you know, it seems like you study conversion and that helps your customers because your website is going to be conversion friendly. And I noticed even the words in the beginning, like this big number, 77% greater conversion rate, which can, you know, goes into their donations going up. What have you learned about increasing conversions? What's worked? Uh, the main thing, you know, we, we have spent a lot of years looking at that for our clients. Mm-hmm. And it's really about you strip away everything that's not essential. Mm-hmm. You focus on that. What is the, what is the single message that you want for our clients, for a nonprofit that's looking to take a donation when they hit a donation page, yeah, they want a simplified form. They don't want to. They want to convert. They want someone right. who hits the page, not to that's bounce right. off the page. They need. They need photos, imagery mm-hmm. that create an emotional connection mm-hmm. to them. They need something that shows that you know as few words as possible that will entice them to make mm-hmm. a donation. Mm-hmm. That's really what we're doing with our website too, is we are, we're focusing on the core of right. what makes us great. And then, but not, you know, doing that in a thousand words that they're not mm-hmm. going to read. Mm-hmm. It's all about keeping it simple. Um, and one of the great things that, that we do, and certainly if you've ever looked at our website or any of our client stuff yeah. is it works on all platforms. Uh, that's really the latest kind of big internet change. Uh, you were ta- we were talking about the, the early days of the internet. Nowadays, it's all about mobile. Mm. So every site that we build for ourselves or for our clients, it's got to be mobile friendly. Right. It's got to work on any device from a smartphone to an iPad to right. desktop computer and everything in between. You have to make sure that, that any website that you build is friendly to all devices and mm-hmm. that the content and the message is friendly to the audience that you're trying to reach. Mm-hmm. Do you use any tools, specific tools for tracking that would be um, good for people to check out if they have their own website that you use to track the conversion or see where people are clicking? Uh, we use we use what I think most businesses use, Google Analytics. Mm-hmm. I mean, if, you're gonna, if you have a website, you, you ha- must have a Google Analytics account. You're definitely going to want to track every every visit to every page mm-hmm. for conversions. We do something really really simple. Um, I mean, have the numbers on our website that we came up with. You know that we get a greater conversion rate than other uh, folks out there. We'll do something really simple. We have Google Analytics. We're tracking the visits to the pages, mm-hmm. and then we're tracking that against the number of donations that have flown that have come through that page. Mm-hmm. It's a very simple process. I don't think companies have to 
Make it too complicated. No, no. You want to take a look at the visits that you're getting. Google Analytics can tell you that. It can tell you uh, how much time they're spending on the site. They can tell you which pages are making an impact. Mm -hmm. Certainly, there are more sophisticated tools that you can you can. There are comp there are things like heat maps where right. you could look at a site and you can you know, track the eyes of the clicks of the user and what right. they're clicking on. It shows like on. red or something when yeah, like a it lot does. of people are so clicking. There's, there's a ton of tools out there, but I don't think you have to be yeah. complicated about it. So. Yeah. What other components with the homepage? Because I do, I love the clean design, how it is simple and everything's big and it stands out. What other components did you find to be impactful? Like obviously you have a, just a real clear headline you know proposition and then you have some of the numbers is there a thought process to the order of this or is it just the way it naturally flowed in the conversation because i see well then you have people are wanting to know about the cost so you have the cost and then you have some of the face with the testimonial and then some of the the logos which are you know credibility mm -hmm. um yeah, we're definitely trying to build trust there. And if you look from from top to bottom on the homepage there, we're really mm. telling the narrative. Mm. Because if our statement is raise more, keep more, then what we want to do is we want to support that as you flow down the page. So mm. the one of the first blocks there is all about the fact that the pages work on all devices. Mm -hmm. So what we're, what we're saying there and with this, those stats is that you're going to raise more money. The next block down is all about the pricing, that you're going to save more, and you'll get some great service along the way. Mm -hmm. And then we're, we're kind of balancing those two things with the logos and the testimonial to give credibility to what we're looking at above, mm -hmm. all with the purpose, both at the top and the bottom, of having that person click to request a demo. Right. Because yeah. then, I'm, then I'm going to set up a, a custom time with them. We're going to do a little web session where I'm going to walk them through all the various features and yeah. benefits and that type of thing. Yeah. So, Ronald, what have been some of the milestones as far as getting big clients uh, for you throughout the years? Milestones for us, I mean, um, getting big clients, uh, probably the biggest one was the Alzheimer's Foundation of America. Mm -hmm. That was huge for us. Uh, and that was early on. They've been... Uh, processing donations with us for over a decade. Wow. Uh, they're now raising um, more than a million dollars a year That's through amazing. the platform. Yeah. Uh, they've been a great client. They've been a great referral source for us. Um, that one big. Uh, I think um, lately we've been really excited um by some of the national organ we're getting local chapters of some of the national organizations like Girl Scouts and Big Brothers Big Sisters mm -hmm. um, we've had a big push over the past few years into monthly giving uh, so helping donors give you know ten dollars a month twenty dollars a month to the charity of their choice and we've had, have some great partners that you know kind of helped us in the consulting on that and have forwarded some clients to us there so you know it's taken a lot of years but um, a couple we, decades we, yeah, yeah we feel so good now because we've kind of put all the pieces together it's taken a long time to put all those pieces together and to find your niche to mm -hmm. find great partners um you know, on the banking side, when you process a credit card for someone, you work with a bank, a merchant account company. This sounds like a nightmare. I mean, it sounds like there's so many uh, moving parts. What's the hardest part about that people don't see because they just want it to work? But what's the hardest part for you in the back end to make things, you know, to keep things smoothly running? Oh, we're always things like security. We're always uh, learning. We're always, I mean, I pay a company once a week to try and hack into our mm, systems. Really? Yeah, yeah. Um, so they'll report you know, any issues that we have, anything that we need to correct, uh, you know, keeping the servers up and running all, you know, 100% uptime, you know, that that we uh, guarantee. So it's, it's, there's a lot of moving parts behind the scenes that customers don't see, but we're working hard to, to, mm -hmm. to make sure it happens. We have to work hard to keep track of the latest technology um, we've just uh, completed another edition of our reporting system for our clients. 
uh, you know, we had to make sure that it's working in the latest browser with the latest technology, right. you know, uh, the redoing our pages so that they work on smartphones. You know, we had to do that in the last, we're always learning, always seeking out the latest thing to make sure that our clients can get paid. So there's a lot of, a lot of moving parts there. Yes. You know, what's the most complex, you know, cause I could see transactions i could see the alzheimer's foundation doing a huge push and you get a ton of traffic and then you have to manage that i can see i mean there's a million different things that are going on what what takes the most your amount of your time uh probably customer service mm. um it's, it's where i spend most of my day mm -hmm is um, we have a platform where we, we guarantee that nonprofits can have unlimited payment pages, as many donation pages as they need, uh, as many event registration pages as they need. And we've got clients that are very technical, and we've got clients that are not very technical. And they can do and it you, themselves with your platform, though. They can do yeah. it themselves, but there are, there are many clients that, that choose to have us do it. To, to, to you know, They've got a new event coming up. And they need to launch a new page where they can do an event registration. And we'll mm -hmm. do it for them. And we're perfectly happy to do it. Um, but that's where we spend most of our time is just assisting them day to day, making sure that everything is running smoothly, mm -hmm. um, you know, for their payment pages. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've got clients that, hey, they'll call and they'll say, hey, it's that time of year. We've got our annual gala coming up. We need to get this event page, and I say, "Hey, just send us the new pricing, send us the dates, and mm -hmm. we get we get it good to go. We get it all set up for mm -hmm. them. We we don't want to put any burden on them, so we put the burden, you know, on us on the yeah. technical side. So, Ronald, what works um, best to get more organizations on board? Really, word of mouth. Um, that's where we get most of our clients. Uh, we get our clients through partners, partner organizations. Um, partner organizations, what do you mean? Well, you know, the, like I say, there's a lot of moving parts to processing a credit card. So we've got partners that will do the merchant account processing for us. We've got partners that we work with that do consulting on fundraising. Mm -hmm. And so they'll feed us clients you know they're actually so those merchant processors who may work with like alzheimer's foundation may recommend that they you know just to make it easy get on your platform right exactly exactly um and so it's word of mouth it's referrals it's the fact that we've been doing this for a long time that mm -hmm. that uh, we've built the trust mm -hmm. we built enough trust um and it's funny we get new clients when one employee of a client leaves mm -hmm. goes to another, another nonprofit, non yeah, right yeah. and then we end up working for them too we've we've just built up a lot of trust uh, over the years and then the website you know i don't do any i used to go to conferences mm -hmm. yeah what'd you do say, early I, on because now yeah. someone may be going well i'm not 20 years in business i right. don't have referrals right what'd you do early on that worked Early on, yeah. early on, and really even now, most of our leads have always come through the website. We've always had people find Google and clicking a little contact us form and find that way. Um, other than that, it's been we get a client and we get word of mouth. Mm -hmm. We get a referral. Yeah. Things that have not worked have been more traditional things, advertising in a trade magazine or a newspaper. Hmm. Uh, I would think a trade magazine would work. Actually, I'm surprised it didn't work at all. It didn't. No. Uh, maybe at the time we didn't have the right message or or what, but it just did not work for us. I think because maybe our product is terrible, we need them to hit the website. We needed them to see examples. We need them to actually get a sense of how it could work for them, especially in the early days where the internet was so brand new. A lot of nonprofits had no clue that they even should be taking a donation online or how that might even work. Yeah. Uh, I, we used to go to, I used to go to conferences and I would set up a booth, you know, at a nonprofit conference and it, it was just a waste of time. Uh, it turns out that, mm. you know, a lot of these conferences, everyone's so focused on 
uh, they'll go to the educational sessions and they'll wave at you, you know, wave at your booth on the way. It was a big expense or not a lot of payoff. Mm-hmm. We've gotten much more payoff in investing in our website, and now we're investing. We're kind of doubling down on that by investing in content marketing. Mm-hmm. Uh, you probably saw our blog mm-hmm. uh, on the website. Yeah. Uh, we're pub- publishing once a week now. Um, we're getting really good feedback on that. We're getting really great feedback on you know, our Twitter feed and things like that. Where we're basically we're making it our job to educate our clients on how to be better fundraisers. Right. And that's that's generating a lot a lot of look sees into our website. Right. You know, a lot of clicks into that, and when they're there, they're going to learn about our product. Right. So it's it's a double fold. We want our clients to raise more money. So if we educate them on how to be better fundraisers, right. we'll get more traffic to the donation pages. We'll do better as a company with more transaction fees. Uh, they'll do better because they're raising more money. Um, it's a win-win-win all around. All around, yeah. exactly. That's interesting because you've been in the business and you just inherently learn what – helps people to fundraise and even with kickstarter indiegogo like that's valuable for those people trying to raise funds in general for themselves or a project so what have you found that has worked the best uh, as far as fundraising goes uh i would say it's really um you know, we kind of go back to that core message if we talk to a nonprofit, i want to know you know, what is the one thing that you're going to do for the community? Mm-hmm. And then you need to sell that one thing. Mm-hmm. You know, we work with, uh, one of the groups that we work with is a group called Project Cure. And they deliver medical supplies to to Africa and in a lot of places uh, in the third world. And if you go to their website, you go to their donation page, it is single focused. It is single focused on if you give us money, these supplies will get delivered. They've even developed specific programs. They have something called kits for kits for kids, and it's specific. It's like little medical uh, supply kits for families. Something that a that a family might have, you know, mm-hmm. in their house. But in the third world, it can be That's a lifesaver. Yeah. Yeah. So they've created a, a specific donation page just for that that speaks to that one thing and it's all about in fundraising when a donor hits your website they really just want want to know a few things they want to know who you are and what you do and you've got with any like with any website you've got just a few seconds three seconds right yeah Yeah, you've got to convince them of that right away so they understand where they've landed then they want to know if i give you money where is that money going to go toward and what impact will it have? Hmm. So the better that they can sell the impact. I mean, we have one client, uh, Caring Kids Cancer. If you go to their website, you'll see that right there on the homepage, they have a huge button that says, we've raised $7 million for children's, to fight children's cancer. Mm-hmm. And then that links you into a section that talks about the impact that that has made. And the cures that the doctors that they work with have been working on. If once you convince them of the impact, then it's where do I click to make the gift? Right. And it's about having a clear, present donate now button that is present on every page of your site. Yeah. It's present, you know, it's in that top corner of the navigation, and there's a little spotlight on the home page that the little tells me, here's what we do. If you give us money, here's what will happen, yeah. and here's where it click. Yeah. It's it's not that complicated. Yeah. It's it's all about keeping it simple, and like we're trying on our website to push people into that request a demo form. Everything on a nonprofit site, if if their job is to raise money, right. it should be about yeah. pushing people into that donation page. Yeah. All yeah. the links, the buttons, the way that you focus the content is all about pushing them in there. Yeah. Now, if their if their job is to get volunteers, then it should you know drive them into yeah. a volunteer sign up form, or you know, it depends on what their yeah. model is and what they're trying to accomplish. Uh, yeah, essentially with fundraising, same yeah, the same thing you do and that you recommend for you is that one single focus call to action, and then the credibility and support. 
And obviously, you know, for the fundraising is a little different if they're saying this is what it's going towards and everything like that. What has been one of the most rewarding campaigns that you've been a part of because people have used or organization used for good cause? Uh, one that comes to mind is uh, the one of our clients is uh, Mercy Health System. It's in the Midwest. It's a network of yeah, hospitals. I've heard of Mercy, yeah. Okay. Uh, well, one of their hospitals, uh, St. John's Hospital in Joplin, Missouri, was completely wiped out by uh, the big Joplin tornado oh, wow. a, few, a few years ago. And the day after it happened, they called us on the phone and uh, they said, you know, we've got, a, we've got to fundraise for the employees, for the, the local community, for the ability to rebuild this hospital. And we just got on a conference call and we said, well, let's build a donation page specific to that campaign. And uh, we had it up within the day. They were blasting out emails and, uh, and tweets and you know, Facebook postings and every other way that they could get the message out um, that uh, if you went to the site, if you donated, it was going to go for two efforts. It was going to go to helping the, the workers at the hospital with the basic needs because not only did they lose their place of business, but many of them lost their homes as well right. in that town. Horrible. It was it was absolutely horrible, um, and it just it gave us a good feeling that we could do something quickly for them, and it resulted in tens of thousands of dollars being raised for that community. Uh, happy and proud to say, you know, we kept going with that. Um, they actually, uh, them and another of our clients, the Community Foundation of the Ozarks, which is near Joplin, Missouri. They um, they actually built a, a rebuild Joplin website, which then linked into a donation page that we built for them, and the city has has come back. The hospital has now been rebuilt and reopened, wow. which is amazing. Um, so I think the ability to know that our clients can call us at the moment and that we made an impact there. I mean we've. We've had clients that have raised money for tornadoes, the, the big tornado in Tuscaloosa. That mm -hmm. was a few years ago. Um, Project Cure was just raising money for the Nepal disaster to send medical supplies there. Just to know that, that we're making an impact. And it, it just feels so good. Mm -hmm. it, certainly, you know, I, I could make a lot of more money if we were doing e-commerce for the for-profit world. But this just gives you that warm and fuzzy feeling right. that you're making an impact, even on the, just a local level. I mean, we've got a organization that we work with here in Atlanta called Cades Club. And what they do is they run an annual camp and other programs and services to um, counsel kids that have lost their parents. Wow. So these are kids that are grieving crazy yeah it, it is and the fact that we can work with a group like that and help them raise money um you know and that's that's not like a national right. you know big disaster relief organization but it's an organization that's doing good uh here in our local community and we work with a lot of school foundations um you know which is a big deal for us my wife is a teacher mm -hmm. so uh she negotiated a little discount for them so <laughs> <laughs> She we knows, work with all types, knows all types of nonprofits. It's fun. So yeah. I think I discovered I was doing um, research for interview someone I was interviewing for a nonprofit, and I just I was like, "This is a beautiful design." I think I scrolled down to the end, and I saw, you know, something built by For a Good Cause or something. And I think I clicked on it, and just to see, and that's kind of how I discovered you, actually. Yeah. And then I saw, wow, they've been doing this forever. Um, yeah. We really need to have have you on, um, you know. Kind of going back to the nonprofit sector because you almost feel like, okay, you're going through this huge turmoil. Let's like just do it. I don't even want to charge you. I mean, that's kind of the. I'm not saying to run a business you need to charge people, right? Mm -hmm. But sure. there is that. This is such a good cause. I want to give this away to you. To I'm going to charge you. This is really worth a lot of money because it's improving conversion donations. How did you decide on pricing? for this 
we kind of looked at what uh, what we thought the marketplace would bear. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think certainly early on we we made mistakes in that. We certainly I think I could have been charging more, but I think that's a mistake that a lot of businesses make mm-hmm. when they're first starting out. Is you're kind of looking at you kind of you trying to judge, and it was something so new that really weren't a lot of other companies right. uh, out there doing it. So we didn't have a lot to judge against. We kind of looked at which what is we thought good and bad, that, right? Good and bad. But we thought we we looked at what we thought the nonprofits could bear and would would pay. Um, and we've had different when we first started the first year. We had a completely different pricing model. We used to take a percentage of the of the, total, right? Because there wasn't. Merchant account companies that would do a lot of things on the web, there weren't a lot available there. There wasn't a lot of technology yet. There was really only a few programs where mm-hmm. that you could hook in, hook a website to process a credit card. Mm-hmm. So we found one way of doing it, and we um, would kind of take a percentage and funnel the money to them. And it just didn't feel right. It didn't um, – and there's still tons of companies that do that, but yeah. we, didn't feel, we didn't feel it was right um, – when a thousand dollar donation is the same hit on our resources as a hundred dollar donation, so we switched our model to what we thought was more fair, which is small, you know, transaction fee, which then we're still covering our costs to on the server and the little things that we have to do to process a, a transaction. But we thought it was it was more fair. Mm-hmm. Um, over the years, uh, we've tried to keep things as, as low and as fair and transparent as possible. I've only had, I think, two or three price increases in 17 years. Mm. Um, you know, maybe yeah. I should have done it more, but I make a respectable, you know, living wage. I'm happy. You know, I got two you kids. Look happy. Yeah. yeah. I, I enjoy I enjoy my job. So uh, the clients are happy. That's that's all we care about. Yeah. Um, and you know, so people have like a monthly charge just to have the hosting and the site, and then there's like an interchange fee based off of the transactions, which I think you explain it better than the credit card companies do actually what <laughs> what that is. Because <laughs> I think I've had conversations with them for like forty minutes. Like I still don't understand what this interchange fee yeah. is for. So you know, it took me a lot. It took me a long time to really come up with a great explanation. Um, as to how e-commerce works and what we do versus what our partners do. Mm. Um, Cause it's, I like it. It's like a small fee, you know, interchange fee. So people, you know, right. so you cover your costs, you make money cause you want to provide great customer service. And so you need to charge people and have a profit there so you can provide right. the best service too. Right. Right. It makes sure that they have the latest technology and everything that they need. Yeah. So, Ronald, I always ask because it's inspired insider. Um, what's been the lowest point, and then how you push through that tough time? Well, I would say a low point for me really is—I wouldn't say it's business related. It's probably more personal related. Um, it has to do with our daughter. Um, we. Um, when she was born, she was born with something called hygromas, and they were mm. in her in her cheek. It's little growths, mm. and we didn't even know it at the time. We thought we thought this was just a happy, big cheek baby, you know. Just looked like uh, big chubby cheek type. Yeah, of, just oh. a chubby cheek baby, and we didn't really notice that there was an issue till I'd say she was about a year old mm-hmm. and she got a cold and one side of her face where most of the hygromas are swelled up hmm. and we noticed that there was a big imbalance or not big but it was an imbalance between the sides of her face and you just don't know what the issue is you right. don't know you the think first the worst thing, thing you think the worst the first thing that comes to your mind is that's cancer right and um, so we went through, you know, uh, a process with doctors and, you know, that basically we need to go in and biopsy that and get that looked at. And one of the steps that we took was uh, we had to, we got an appointment down at the Aflac Cancer Center, mm-hmm. which is at the Children's Hospital here in Atlanta. And... Sitting in the waiting room was probably the the low point because 
you're looking around and you think that's this this could be us here you see families that are there and um you know this could be this this could be what's in store for us and it was a hard process we got we, she had to have surgery uh which was fraught with danger too because they had to pull something out of her cheek which if they if they hit a certain nerve then you'll right. never, you'll never smile again right but it's just something that that had to be done um and luckily you know the, we had a fantastic surgeon and the biopsy came back negative and you know she's had a couple surgeries since then and it's we've had a lot of it taken out but just i think that day when we visited the cancer center was was a low point because yeah. you're just you worrying about your kids and yeah. and where you go from there and it also to kind of tie it into the business side it informed that we were on the right path with for a good cause mm-hmm. because at the time that we went down there the the Aflac Cancer Center was was one of my clients. Mm. So we were actually raising money for the place that we were at right. that's doing this amazing research on children's cancer. Came full circle. Yeah. It came full circle and I came <clears throat> home, you know, and we, we talked about it many times that yeah, this is this is the path that we we should be on. And we're supposed to be on because yeah. there are so many nonprofits out there that are doing good work like these folks were yeah. to help these families that we need the websites that we build to, to do something to make a difference. Um, yeah. So why is that story not on your website? <laughs> like I that say, should be in your you about. Know, like I see, I, I, it took me a long time to put my photo up there. I I've never tried to make it be about <laughs> yeah about us, but uh, that should be on your about about section too. You maybe know? maybe we had a hard time having her too. We we um uh we it took us a long time to have kids. We had to get some you know professional help in that mm-hmm. in that manner. Um, you know. It taught me a lot about just overcoming things. Um, you know, when you had going through something, reach out for help. Uh, we reached out to a, there's a nonprofit called Resolve mm-hmm. that uh, kind of educates um, educates families that are having trouble having kids, educates them on fertility, adoption, and a whole bunch of other things. Which and, is uh, really common. Yeah, it really is, and but we didn't know, we didn't know it was common. Right, and you think you're you, you think you're you, the only one. You think you're the only one. We came across so many people that we knew at the. Uh, there was a time when we knew fifteen people who were having kids, fifteen families, and it was just all around us. And we went to a meeting there, and um, it just it was like ah, oh, okay. opens your eyes. Yeah, we're not alone, and we can get through anything. You know, um, nowadays, even with my business, you know, you're never too old to to get the advice and kind of sit down with people. Um, I'm a regular, uh, I have regular meetings with SCORE, the Retired Executives Group. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, it says, you know, you need to kind of sit down with with yeah. with people that you can bounce things off of and know that you know, whatever you're going through, you're not alone. So, yeah. so Ronald, who are some of your mentors? Uh, you know, I don't think that I had a lot of real kind of business mentors. Certainly, like I said, family. Um, you know, one person that might stand out in that I worked retail uh, for many, many years. Um, uh, I mentioned that I had, you know, bad bosses along the way, but I had one really fantastic boss. Mm-hmm. Uh, his name was Joe Braxton, and he was the manager above me in – the men's department at a small department store in Auburn, Alabama. Mm -hmm. And he was just incredibly kind, patient. He would, he would instruct you on what he needs you to do, but he did it with just extreme class. Mm. And I, I remember that, you know, wherever I was going to work, I was going to be like Joe. I, 
I was going to kind of conduct myself with the mm-hmm. same thing. He would be flexible with you. Yeah. He, you know, whenever um, I got my college classes for that semester, we'd sit down. He'd say, "Tell me your schedule. We're going to work around it." I mean, I used to come in to work from eight to twelve in the morning. I would go to class from one to five or one to four, and then I would come back and work five to nine. So I was working full time, but he would he work it out. As as, it, yeah. yeah, as long as you're coming in, you're getting your work done. Mm-hmm. As long as you're producing the results, that's what was going to matter. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, if you can be like Joe, um, you yeah. were doing you were doing pretty yeah. well. Always a kind voice. He'd sit down and explain what he wanted you to do, why he wanted you to do it. Not just go do it, but this is how it was going to help mm-hmm. the business. Yeah. So I learned a lot about sales. I learned a lot about just retail and you know why one product moves versus another. Why you know you know yeah. I was I was in charge of doing all the markdowns, all the little things he do, and you know, he was there as just teaching me along the way. Yeah. So Ronald, what was one of those hard times in business that you had to push through? <clears throat> well. I think it's a hard time probably for us. It actually was it was great personally, but it was hard on the business was after my daughter was born, uh, we made a decision as a family. I mean, my wife is a teacher. We made a decision that, you know, since I was running and still do run a home-based yeah, business. Yeah, you could work from home. Yeah. Yeah, that the kids were going to be with me. We weren't going to have a nanny. We weren't going to. Hey, put good luck in, getting any work done. No, right. <laughs> we weren't going to have. We weren't going to put them in daycare. That um, and I wanted to do it. I wanted to be there with them all the time. Right, right. So we kind of kind of scaled back the business in a lot of ways. You know, I we stopped all the advertising. We let we just let just word of mouth bring new clients to us, and we had enough to 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 keep ourselves going. But you're right; it was hard. To get things done, it was hard to uh, kind of be there at that instant when a client would call or when you need to do a sales presentation. Um, I got a dirty the, diaper over here. I got to take care of. I did. I did. I changed a lot of diapers. Uh, it was great personally. Um, it was a joy. They were amazing. And on the business side, one very positive thing is it actually helped me identify who were going to be great clients. Because you have to cut out everyone else. You only can keep the best ones. Is that why? Well, when when potential clients would call and they were inquiring about our company, I would have to preface the fact that there are two toddlers right with me, right beside me. I might have a baby carrier right next to the desk. You know, I might have a, a three year old running around the desk. Right. So I would in my welcome speech I would let them know that uh that my two little vice presidents, uh, you may hear them in They're the, the back- presidents. You may yeah. hear them in the background, and that also was letting people know, kind of, you know, we were a family company that was going to be the priority, right. that kind of stuff. And I had some potential clients that I could tell right away that that was we were done. We were done. They they just could not handle that I would have my kids with me when I needed to help them. Right. And then I had other clients who turned out to be clients that have stayed with me for a decade who said that is fabulous right i they said i did that that right. i worked at home and i had my kids and it was wonderful right, right. And it, it turned out to be this great not a business just a business fit but a personal personal right. fit too and you need that in business you know you need the client that has to fit with you personally yeah you know, I think most. I hope most of the clients that we have now, I consider them friends. Right. Yeah. You know, if so, Ronald. So, what's been one of the proudest moments in the business for you? Uh well, I think when we hit ten million per year for the for our clients, that we that we hit an achievement where they had raised ten million dollars in one year. Yeah. That was that was huge. It really. He sat back and big number, yeah. Big number. We made it. We're making a huge impact. Um, that was that was big. Um, certainly in the early days, becoming profitable. To know that, gosh, we can actually do. I can actually do this. 
that this can be a viable business that you can actually do do good and do well at the same time. Yeah. That we can make this work. That this can be something that I, I hope to do this till I retire. Yeah. I hope that I hope that Or you just won't retire. So, well maybe. Yeah. <laughs> I'm teaching my kids to, to uh to program currently. Oh yeah? Yeah, yeah. I'm teaching we're teaching them uh uh, the Python language and how do to program. You do it, how do you do it? Do you do it with a special program like online or do you just, how do you actually teach them? It's like other people want to be like, oh, I want to teach my kids too. <laughs> There's a book that we found, mm-hmm. um, how to teach your kids to code and the language is Python. You can probably Google it and find it. Mm-hmm. But it's little step-by-steps. So um, we started this summer and in between all the baseball games and everything else that we do, we found some nights to sit down and and uh, just kind of go through the book and less little mm-hmm. lessons step by step. And, you know, maybe when they're teenagers, I can give them a job. You never know. How old do you think the kids have to be for you to start? Or when did you start? How old were they? Well, they're 9 and 10. Okay. Or 9, or ten, or nine and 11 yeah. now. So that's we've, we've just started doing okay. that. Um, my son, who's 9, expressed an interest in it. So we yeah. said, yeah, so let's, let's try it. That's fantastic. Yeah. Ronald, I really appreciate your time. This has been amazing. And um, I have one last question for you. But before I ask it, just tell people where they can go to find out more and uh, where they should check you out. Uh, just check us out at fourgoodcause.com. That's the number four, A, goodcause.com. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, you know, invite them to read our blog and check out our social feeds and uh, learn more about uh, being good fundraisers. Yeah. And from a, you know, business from a business perspective just to look and see the layout and design, it's really well laid out and you can tell you took the time to think through each part of the of the site. I appreciate um, that. So what's the best thing about having your own business working from home? <laughs> Uh, never having to wear that suit and tie. Um, I tell you one thing that I just really love, um, and this is kind of part of my daily routine, or I try to make it part of my daily routine, is uh, every day before lunch, uh, outside this window is the driveway, and uh, I have a basketball goal there, mm. and I will spend a half an hour just okay. shooting the basketball. It clears my mind. Yeah. Uh, it just I'm the makes, same way. Yeah, it just makes me happy. It just yeah. clears my mind. Um, yeah, it, it's great working from home. It really is. Uh, and and you make it work. You know, you can build a virtual team. You know, it's like any other business. Uh, I just enjoy it. It's nice during the summer. Um, of course, my wife is off. The kids are home. Everybody's home. Um, you know, they come just, down and say hello. Like, it's very enticing. Yeah. Yeah. It's very nice. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you're ever in Chicago, we'll play a game of horse. Or okay. if I'm ever up by you or down by you. Uh, but thank you so much, Ronald. Everyone should check out forgoodcause.com. I appreciate it very yeah. much. Thank you for having me on. Yeah. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire. Came out better on the other side. Like a peach if you find the same right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand